the morning. I was a few minutes behind too. The tech really doesn't seem to be cooperating with me. Um, I So I had initially hoped to show my face this morning and um, it just wasn't working through Zoom. So here I am just sharing my screen. Facebook doesn't allow to share um, your face and your screen. So I hope you will um, just enjoy the ride with the PowerPoint today. Um, so like I said, my name is Katherine Leswing, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about mindfulness and wellness with you. I think mindfulness is one of those um, buzzwords a little bit that we hear a lot about, especially in education these days. It's definitely gained some traction, um, but not everyone fully understands exactly what is meant by mindfulness. So that's the purpose um, of this session. And then I hope to share a couple of technology permitting a couple of um, exercises for you. If the technology doesn't work, we can just um, do them together without the, the help of a little media. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it today. As usual, um, you can join us and follow us on our different media channels and definitely check out our website, nhlearnsremotely.com. It is um, full of resources for you while we are in remote learning. So the big idea for today's session is that research has shown that mindfulness practice has positive impacts on all sorts of parts of the brain and behavior. In particular, memory, stress levels, diet or nutrition, um, sleep, and developing feelings of empathy. So as we move through the, um, the presentation today, I want you to just keep in mind that um, the reason that mindfulness has all of a sudden, not really all of a sudden, but over the past couple of decades has gained so much traction is that research has shown time and again that it has uh, really impressive impacts, positive outcomes for these different parts of brain function and behavior. So what is meant when we say mindfulness? It's, it's, so it's great that it has all of these impacts, but what do we mean when we're actually talking about mindfulness. There's a couple of definitions. These are straight dictionary definitions. The first being that the quality or state, it's the quality or state of being conscious or aware of something. So it's really um, being present as the second definition uh, provides a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment. So when I think about this or when I hear this, um, I think of mindfulness as, yes, it's about being present, but it's also the, um, the effort that goes into becoming present. We know that we all live very busy lives and uh, it's hard to always be right in the moment that we're in. And sometimes even technology is getting in the way of that these days. So how do we do that? I love this little graphic here. I, when I was in the classroom, I would share this with my students. We always did a little mindful minute at the beginning of each class. And they really grabbed on to this graphic of mindful or mindful, right? So the person on the left we can see has all, all sorts of stuff juggling around in their brain. Um, they're thinking about, you know, what's going to what are they gonna make for dinner? Oh, did I say something stupid at that staff meeting earlier this morning? Uh, I have so much work to do when I get home. I'm worried that so-and-so is mad at me. Um, while the other person, the person on the right, has exactly the image of where their feet are, right? They're on the walk with the other person. So mindfulness, when we think about it, is really how do we put our feet exactly, or put our mind where our feet are, and really be present in the moment. I am just disclaimer, I am not a psychologist. I'm not a um, expert in neuroscience. And so my explanation of how mindfulness can impact the brain is gonna be very, very um, cursory and not super in depth. But I think it's worth noting that research, as I mentioned uh, time and again, has shown that, um, that mindfulness has a huge positive impact on the brain. And so why is that? A lot of it is related to our emotional responses. So when we have a stimulus, 
um, that puts us on guard, the first really point of contact in the brain is what they call, some people refer to it as the lizard brain, but it's really that lower level brain functioning. Um, and the amygdala is really the first place of, um, of reception. So when we get a stimulus like that, it's the amygdala, amygdala that will trigger an emotional response. Elevated levels of cortisol, which is the stress uh, hormone, can affect its activity. And it's the amygdala that's really going to send us into fight or flight pretty quickly. Um, the information that's received by the amygdala goes to the hippocampus, which is uh, the center of short-term memory. And the hippocampus is going to help us make a little sense of what that stimulus is coming from the amygdala. Can I connect it to um, the context a little bit? Do I have back uh, sort of uh, backstory information that can help me make sense of whether this is a really dangerous situation or whether I can calm myself down? And then what is considered the more developed brain, and it, it really truly is the more developed brain, is the prefrontal cortex. So once the stimulus has passed through the amygdala, the hippocampus has given us some context. Maybe it's the hippocampus that says, oh, that barking dog, it sounds scary, but I know that dog doesn't bite, so I don't need to um, have a, a major fear reaction. But really, it's the prefrontal cortex, which is what makes us human and which separates us from other animals. And it's the more recently developed part of the brain. And it's also part of the brain that we can really start to retrain. So the prefrontal cortex is the center for executive functioning. It regulates thought, emotions, actions. Um, it's especially vulnerable to the elevated brain chemicals caused by stress. So if things are um, really haywire, if we're feeling really stressed, it's harder to regulate the prefrontal cortex and it's harder to regulate our behavior. Where mindfulness connects into this is that mindfulness can actually help train parts of the prefrontal cortex to really step back and say, is this a situation I need to um, react heavily to? It can help us come back down and get centered. Again, disclaimer, my explanation of all of this brain science is very cursory. I may have even misstepped, but you get the general idea of it's the prefrontal cortex that we're really trying to, um, to harness and to address when we're practicing mindfulness. So how do we practice mindfulness? There's a ton of different ways you can do it. There's no right way or wrong way. Um, it's very common to focus on the breath. It's um, when we focus on the breath, we're actually practicing meditating or really sitting quietly and coming back to the present moment. What, uh, other ways you can savor the mundane. I love uh, folks who enjoy eating mindfully, which is, you know, they, they savor every bite. They really um, explore the flavors of whatever they're eating. You can do it with your morning coffee. Sometimes we just, you know, we're sipping and we're eating while we're also looking at our phones and we're not even really paying attention to the fact that we're eating and having this incredible sensory experience. So you can savor what seems to be, you know, the more ordinary things in life. Taking a tech break, technology, although it's an amazing tool, has really um, actually, it's impacting our prefrontal cortex in a way that's contrary to what mindfulness does. So when we take a, a tech break, we're able to get um, more regulated and more centered a lot of the times. Mindfulness um, practice allows us to attend to, allow and attend to feelings. So in our world, it's almost human, it is human, to want to run away from uncomfortable feelings. But we also know that running away from uncomfortable feelings um, doesn't help us process them, doesn't help us work through them, and can result in some unwanted behavior later. Um, and so mindfulness practice helps us make space for those feelings and attend to them in a way that gives them what they need, which is a lot of time just space and some nurturing. Um, and another way to practice mindfulness is to listen. Um, we talk about active listening sometimes, but occasionally when we are interacting with people, we're not always giving them our, our full 100% um, attention, and so we can mindfully listen. So those are just a few ways that we can practice mindfulness.
Um, so I thought we could now practice a few um, together. So the first one, the base of mindfulness, the things that really bring us back to the present and help us to train our brain is almost always the breath. And why is this? It gives our attention an anchor and our breath is always there. As long as we are walking this planet, we have our breath and it's that part of our um, functioning is really operated by um, a part of the brain that's, that's beyond our control. It's automatic. And so it's always there and we can always come back to it. So how do we focus on our breath? We can focus on the flow of air in and the flow of air out. We can count the breath. We can inhale for four, we can hold it for four, and we can exhale for four. There is no shortage of free resources on the internet now. Um, I'll offer a few at the end of this presentation. But really, um, focusing on the breathing is one of the most basic and simple ways to come back to the space and be mindful. One of the um, resources that I like out there, it's the Calm app. I will say a uh, disclaimer, they have some free options, but it is a paid, um, it is a paid for app. But uh, they have a breathe bubble, and I just find this incredibly re relaxing, and I found this on YouTube, so you can uh, do this. But we can just do this together. It's only 30 seconds, and it will tell you when to breathe in, and the bubble expands, and then when you breathe out, the bubble gets smaller. So we can do this one together. So I think it's always interesting to see how you feel after um, engaging in an activity like that that's um, mindful. And that was such a brief experience, but um, noticing how we can feel our physiology change when we practice these things. Um, so that was, a, again, a very brief snippet of a way you can practice your breathing. Um, and then we can do another one for kids that I really like. This is something that kids can do at home. You don't even need an app or anything for it. And it's, um, I'm trying to think of a, a, a catchy name for it, maybe um, finger breathing. And so the way you do it is you create a gentle fist in your lap. And you can put both feet on the floor and get comfortable. Um, and then with each inhale, you just focus on the inhale. And then on the exhale, you'll unfurl one finger. So we can do this together. And as you go, you on the exhale, you'll unfurl one more finger. And we'll do it until we have one open palm in our lap. So inhale. And on the exhale, unfurl a finger. Exhale and unfurl another finger. Hope you, hopefully you ended up with a full open palm there. Um, and you can do that, you know, until you have two open palms, you could do it as many times as you really need, but it's a good way for kids to um, see how they're counting their breaths and how they're getting centered with their breath. So that's sort of the foundation for where a lot of med meditating comes from. Um, why do we meditate? Why do we hear so much about meditating? Meditating is really the main tool for practicing mindfulness, um, or the one that's probably the most talked about. And as mentioned earlier, it just has huge positive neurological and physio uh, physiological impacts. So how do folks meditate? We just practice a little breathing exercises there. 
So we have that part down. So um, you find a comfortable position. A lot of people recommend having uh, both feet on the floor or if you're sitting cross-legged, um, having your back nice and straight. So you're comfortable, but you're alert. Um, as you're meditating, you'll just notice how your body feels. You're going to feel your breath as it comes into your body and as it exits your body. A lot of people think one of the misconceptions is that meditating is the absence of thoughts. It's almost impossible for any human to have zero thoughts at a time. And I'm sure even the best meditators can tell you that they have mind wandering happen as they're meditating. So when the mind has wandered, you just come back to the breath and you say, oh, I'm actually focusing on my breath as I sit here, focusing on being present in the room as I sit here. Um, and I think one of the biggest things is to be kind to yourself. Meditating is meant to not have any judgment attached to it. Um, and so again, we will um, have a quick video clip here of just how to meditate. Or it's a, it will lead you through um, a mindfulness meditation. It's three minutes long. And uh, when it's over, we'll come back together. So if you want to follow along, you can start your day right <laughs> with a three-minute meditation. Close your eyes and find a comfortable position. During this brief meditation, I'll ask you to pay attention to what's happening inside your body right now. You'll find that you don't have to change anything. Just observe. Direct your attention towards your stream of thoughts. What thoughts are traveling through your mind right now? Can you give them a name? Notice your feelings. What feelings are present in your body in this moment? Maybe sadness, curiosity, anger. If you can, try to give them a name. Try to notice if there are other kinds of sensations present in your body right now, like tingling, tension, vibrations. Just observe them and let them be. Now shift your focus and pay close attention to your breath. Notice how it feels to breathe in and breathe out. Try to give your breath your undivided attention for a few seconds. Lastly, try to expand your focus and take in the whole body. Notice that you're sitting here with your whole body. You become aware of your posture, your facial expression, your feelings and other sensations. Hold them in awareness, just as they are. Notice that you don't have to struggle to change anything. It's okay to let them be just as they are right now. When you feel ready, open your eyes and return to your session.
close your eyes and so i hope that that was um helpful for you i enjoy that particular meditation again it's um it's a free resource on youtube um from the neurological network and it just walks you through um really the steps of how to meditate and how to um, go through the process and that one's really particularly short so i think sometimes people aren't as um, interested in meditating because they think well i don't have 20 30 minutes a day to really get into a meditation and i think one of the key points is to start small. And when we think about how this translates to students, um, we can incorporate all sorts of little mindfulness activities into the classroom. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, when I was teaching, I would just do a mindful bell in, in the morning um, at the beginning of each class. And students could take that moment just to get themselves centered. So it was really probably no more than 60 seconds. Um, and they really grew to appreciate it and um, enjoy that moment where they didn't have to have any other distractions or inputs and they could just sit and be in their body. So here are a few resources um, that I like and I am in offering them to you to maybe explore if you're interested. We're not endorsing these in any way, but, um, but they are available to anyone who's interested. Um, my personal favorite um, app for meditation, guided meditations, is the Insight Timer. I think that it has the most free content um, and you can search videos based on the um, length of the meditation. So you can do five, 10, 15, 20 minutes, probably even more. And it has all sorts of different teachers and, and free resources on there. Um, Calm and Headspace are also really highly recommended. They both have some free features, but then they both also have a paid subscription. So I'm less inclined to, to use them as even though um, they do offer some, some great resources. And if you're content with just the free um, content, then, then those could be good resources for you. Um, Mindful.org is a great resource to check out if you want to just learn more about some of the science behind mindfulness. Um, get resources. They have a whole bunch of content on their on their website. And then Insight Meditation Society has a whole ton of free meditations um, that they're offering. And then podcasts that I like. These, I'm realizing that this list is really my own personal uh, <laughs> hit list, but uh, I hope you'll find and find something that you like. And please, please, please put things in the comments that uh, that you enjoy. Um, the Happiness Lab I like. It's out of um, Yale. A woman, Dr. Laurie Santos, has done a whole breadth of research on what makes us happy. Um, and she, a, a lot of her research focuses on mindfulness. Um, and this is a podcast that really each, each week takes a different topic. Um, and she looks at the science behind, does it contribute to our, our wellness and our happiness? So it's not directly... Um, mindful meditation related, but I did find that there's a lot of overlap there with what she's found. And I like that it's science-based and digs into some of the research. Um, on the flip side of that coin, um, Tara Brock is a meditation teacher located in Washington, DC area. And she offers um, just uh, all of her meditations, guided meditations and talks. She does a whole, um, whole uh, ton of talks about different mindfulness topics. Um, and those are all free on her website. And she has a podcast you can subscribe on um, if you do Spotify or, or whatever it is, the platform that you use. So I hope that you enjoyed uh, this overview today. I hope that it offered you some insight. Again, please put things in the comments that you use. I would love to hear how we're using uh, mindfulness in schools. And that just gave me an idea for another topic, um, how we can integrate mindfulness into schools when, uh, when we come back. But I hope this gave you a primer on what is mindfulness um, and why is it important for development in the brain. Um, we hope you will enjoy or join us this afternoon. We'll be back with Playworks uh, New England, which is an awesome organization uh, nationally. They are also in New England and here in New Hampshire. We'll be talking about healthy play and for some tips for how we can get students playing at home now that we're doing remote learning. And check out the rest of our sessions that we will be coming to you with for the rest of the week um, on Facebook Live and on YouTube Live. 
and we hope you have a great rest of your morning. Thanks for joining us today.